Phyllis, I don't know if you're seeing this, but I know we have several clients on our delivery day who, when we call to make their list, sometimes they'll say, oh, I don't need that this week. Let, we can leave that for somebody else. Um, because even our clients are, are trying to participate in this like community sharing, right? They see mm -hmm. themselves as part yep. of the community and they wanna make sure that there's enough for everybody. I, I think that really is the spirit here that comes from a place of believing that everybody should have enough to eat. I'm Sherry Vandenacker and I'm here with the Reading Coalition for Prevention and Support. And today we're going to be speaking with Reverend Jamie Michaels and with Phyllis Maxwell of the Reading Food Pantry. Thank you so much for being on today. We really appreciate it. Great to be with you, Sherry. We're smiling under here if you can't. <laughs> I can see those smiling eyes. So I see that you are at the food pantry now. Is that so? That's correct. All right, for folks who don't know about the Reading Food Pantry, would you like to tell us a little bit about your location and your history? Okay, well, we're located at Old South United Methodist Church, and uh, we've been here forever. Food Pantry started in the um, 1980s with one closet with food in it, and uh, small bags of food were given out at that time. And uh, someone who worked in the mental health field came here to um, supply her clients also. So it started growing and growing and now you can see what we are. It's wonderful. How long have you been involved with it, Phyllis? I've been here 13, almost 14 years. Oh, thank you. And why did you get involved? Well, I was the church secretary here and in the beginning, the food pot pantry was part of my responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, as time went on and it got bigger, other groups became more involved. Our social concerns committee took it over. But when I faced retirement, um, the person who had been working closely with them, Barbara Boucher, decided she was going to move out of town. And she said to me, this is the perfect spot for you, Phyllis. Um, I want you to keep busy while you're retired. And so that's how I got here. Well, and she was right. Not only is it the perfect spot for you in retirement, but because you have such a passion for helping these clients, like I can see that when you work with them. You don't uh, do something for 13 years as a volunteer unless you're right for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love my clients and I love my volunteers. Yeah. So. Tell us about the need for food. I think a lot of times we think of Reading as a wealthy community and it's very easy to forget how many people in the United States, in Massachusetts and in Reading, Massachusetts are food insecure. And how has the need been changing through the pandemic? It got more dramatic as time went on, um, especially during the first part of COVID when people lost their jobs. Um, that is evening out now because of all the um, that the government, both state and federal, has done for these people. So um, now we're dealing more with people that are just on the edge of um, not being able to feel, feed their families or feed their families well. Um, half of our clients approximately are over 65 years of age have lived in Reading for a number of years and now find they can't keep up with the taxes, increase in food, um, utilities, all those kinds of things. So that's where a lot of our clients come from now. And I think that does surprise people that so many of our clients are seniors. You know, I think I think you're right, Sherry, that, the, that sometimes the picture that, um, that we have of poverty, the picture we have of, of food insecurity is that it 
that it sort of lives in a slum or it lives, you know, um, in places that don't look like the town of Reading, right? But a lot of what we see is, is like Phyllis said, folks who are on the edge, who are maybe one or two paychecks away from, from a real crisis, and folks who are struggling with some of that long-term stuff, like, um, like being uninsured or underinsured, and mm -hmm. so facing medical bills, that sort of thing, facing um, property taxes because they've lived here for a long time that are increasing, and, and facing those sort of higher costs of living that are making it harder for them to care for themselves and their families. And lots of our seniors care for other family members too, or have other family members living with them. So that's that's a factor as well. Thank you. Um, you know, this is a topic that means a lot to me because when I was growing up, my family was food insecure too. And sometimes you can scrape together enough to have pasta and so forth. But when we really want to start looking at nutritious, well-rounded, balanced meals, Sometimes a family needs some extra help with that. And it's so wonderful you're here. Now, I still think, though, there's still a lot of stigma associated with asking for help uh, or needing help or even receiving help if someone else nominates you. What would you say to folks who feel hesitant about asking? Well, I try to say to them, you know, we're here to meet your needs. Um, it doesn't mean... Um, any stigma attached to it. It's like, you know, we're part of the village of Reading and we wanna make sure that everyone in the village is well taken care of. And uh, most people are receptive to it. Of course, I probably don't see the ones that aren't <laughs> receptive because they don't come. Right. But, uh, you know, we try to make them feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And in uh, my job, when I'm not busy with COVID was to talk with clients to find out how they were feeling, what they needed, encourage them to take healthier food. Um, and, uh, and I love that part of it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm one of the volunteers that fills the bags because mm -hmm. we have space limits and there can only be so many of us in here. And there are no clients in here, they're out in their cars. Yeah. So it's been more difficult. Phyllis, I don't know if you're seeing this, but I know we have several clients on our delivery day who, when we call to make their list, sometimes they'll say, oh, I don't need that this week. Let, we can leave that for somebody else. Um, because even our clients are, are trying to participate in this like community sharing, right? They see mm -hmm. themselves as part yep. of the community and they wanna make sure that there's enough for everybody. I, th I think that really is the spirit here that comes from a place of believing that everybody should have enough to eat, right? And so I, I try to tell our clients, like, I'd love for everybody to be able to see, this is even what you're seeing behind us is just a small fraction of what we have here. There is food for you. And what I would say to folks is, is please use the service. Like, yes. you know, there's no judgment here from the staff, from the volunteers. We want you to, we want you to have enough and we want your kids and your families to have enough. So be sure to use it. So how have your services changed with COVID? Well, almost every service has changed somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have few volunteers, so we're we're doing that. Um, we in the beginning did not always have enough food, but this community be, has been so generous to us. You can't believe the food that comes to us. It's it's just overwhelming sometimes. Uh, people ask, well, what do you need? Well, I don't know from one week to the next. But I have groups that will, on demand, go out and get something I need. Um, and that's wonderful. You know, the schools, the churches, individuals, everyone has contributed whatever we needed. So the only times we haven't had items is when they're just not available. At the grocery, yeah. You can't find them in the grocery store. You can't find them online. I can't get them for the Greater Boston Food Bank. Um, but basically we've been able to meet most needs. Uh, one funny thing that we found out was people like spam. Uh, <laughs> I remember spam from growing up. <laughs> my mother used it as a fill-in when we didn't have anything else to eat because I came from a circumstance like you did. Um, but to me, it's the last thing I would ever want to put on a plate for someone. 
but we couldn't get it for ages and people really wanted it. I know it's easy to fix. And so that meets people's needs. Yeah. But that was one of the, the things that I used to say, I, I couldn't believe that that was on the top of our list of needs for, you know, a month or more. So. So for those of us who'd like to get involved, how can we, how can we help you? Can we donate food and how do we do that? How, do you have a list of what you're looking for and where would we find that? Will you need people to actually physically come in at some point? Well, we have some people now that are volunteering to do that for us. They're doing shopping. I also have um, two clients that go and do huge amounts of, of shopping and they pay for all of it. Um, it's hundreds of dollars every couple of weeks, but they're more than willing to do that. Um, last time I asked them for um, fresh oranges, which we hadn't been able to get. And this donor must have gone to stop and shop and got oranges every right orange off, that was the, there. <laughs> off the counter. Yeah. You know, they were in 18 or something like that, 18 pound bags. And they were the best oranges I've seen in ages. I mean, it, it just means so much when people can do things like that. We hadn't been able to get um, onions. And he went and bought us sacks and sacks and sacks of Vidalia onions, which are a treat, I think, to anyone. Yeah. They're so sweet and nice to use. So I know our clients were you know, thrilled with that. Um, right now, we're in pretty good shape. Um, I myself would prefer that we had donations of gift cards or money, because um, if I have to go and get something, I can use a gift card. Um, and uh, the money is always there if we need to get something. So, so how would people go about donating money or gift cards to you? What will we do? There, so there are a couple of ways. First of all, you can always send things um, here to the church, 6 Salem Street, uh, Reading and Market Food Pantry, and it'll get where it needs to go. Um, you can follow our Facebook and a Facebook page and our website. So our Facebook page is just just search for the Reading Food Pantry. You'll find us. Our website, um, which was beautifully designed by Michelle Faulkner, mm -hmm. um, is uh, readingfoodpantry.com, and that has information about when we're open. It's also if you need food, it's a great resource to know when you should come and how you should go about about registering. Um, we've, we have a lot of volunteers right now sort of filling our regular spaces. And as you can imagine during COVID, it's hard to onboard new volunteers. So what we need most is folks who can make a long-term commitment. Um, and so always feel free to reach out to us. You can uh, email us through the website or you can um, message us through Facebook and we'll let you know what's available. Also, if you're just keeping an eye on the Facebook page, from time to time, we do have a volunteer opportunity that just pops up. Like we need somebody tomorrow to do the shopping because we had, you know, it, as an example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so keep an eye out there and, and that would be a good way if you have some flexibility, especially during the days. You know, a lot of our work gets done during the work day. So, it, you know, our, we distribute on our delivery time, we, which we added during COVID because we had some people who were homebound or who, had high needs and who couldn't leave their, their homes. So we started a delivery program for the first time and that runs during the day on uh, a, a couple of Wednesdays a month. But one of our distribution times is during the day on Friday and one is in the evenings on Monday. So a lot of the work we do actually gets done during the workday, which I know can be hard for some volunteers, but keep an eye out on our Facebook and our uh, website. And th those are great places to look for volunteer opportunities. And we do have a PayPal link on both of those places. If we know of people who are in need, can we nominate people or refer people who might be too shy to reach out themselves? That's a great question, Sherry. We don't do a lot of, um, we don't do a lot of proactive reaching out to people. You know, I, I like you and like Phyllis, um, grew up in a home where we were sometimes food insecure. Um, we were on, we were on food stamps and WIC and we, we used those services. And, um, and I think about where my mom and I were during that time. And if, 
and and would I have liked for somebody from the church or from a mission to call me and ask if I needed help? And I think we, you know, one of the things we do is try to preserve the dignity of all of our clients, right? And so um, I, I think if you know somebody who's in, in need, maybe have that conversation with them and just say, you know, I saw that I saw this piece about the Reading Food Pantry and everybody seems super friendly and they want everybody to use it. So, you know, I give Phyllis a call because she's really sweet. <laughs> uh, she was <laughs> <laughs> Have any of the changes that you've made to respond to the pandemic likely to continue afterwards, for instance, delivery? Yeah, I, th I think it's possible that we're, I mean, we're, we're sort of in a period of discernment right now as we sort of assess what's going on and, and how we might be changing things. But I, th I think deliveries might be something that continue for a, a, that small portion of our clients who can't physically get to the food pantry or who have a medical need that they need to stay home. It's been a, that's been a really effective program. Have there been other changes you've made during COVID that you expect to continue? we added a sort night. <laughs> we had to, donations were coming in so quickly. Please interrupt me if yes, you have okay. something, Fine. Phyllis. But um, donations were coming in so quickly and the, the basket, so one of the things you can do if you have food to donate, you can always drop it in the, there's a basket at Market Basket and one at Stop and Shop. So on your way out of the grocery store, if you pick up a couple of things for the food pantry, you can drop them in there. And those, those um, boxes were filling up so fast that we had to add on Wednesday evenings now people come in just to sort the things that come in there and um, so I, I think probably I'm, I'm guessing that the generosity of the Reading community is not going to run out as COVID runs out and we'll keep that around too. So maybe awareness about the need um, has grown and that we're hoping that will continue even after COVID is over, that people will become a little more cognizant of the, the variation of the socioeconomic need in our community and respond to it. Now, if I'm going to stop and shop or market basket and I wanna pick up a few things, what is particularly useful? Um, every month I post a little um, eight and a half by 11 sheet at both stores with oh, the things great. you need most. Okay, so on my way into the store, I can see that sign on the box. And so I'll know you're looking for tuna or peanut butter or something of that nature. This yeah. one. Great. Um, big sellers are always, um, I, I can never find them. Beef stew on the shelves. Um, we love beef stew. Phyllis mm -hmm. said spam um, is a big seller. Peanut butter is always a good one. Any kind of canned meat. I know a lot of people in Reading don't eat that. But our clients do. Canned chicken, canned turkey. Um, that because it's a great way to get protein into your diet in a way that doesn't, you know, like so. Some of our clients have limited refrigeration, yep. um, or it might be difficult to cook those fresher mm -hmm. foods. And so having that stuff on hand is a great way to add protein into your diet too. Absolutely, a good chicken salad sandwich is always pretty right? well, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything I, else that you'd like to add that we didn't cover yet? Well, we didn't talk about serving our clients in drive-through. That's right. okay. And we have um, three or four dedicated volunteers who do that, come rain, snow, slush, Sweet ice, <laughs> ice, everything. And uh, without them, we couldn't do it. So I wanna highlight that. That probably will go away after COVID, um, we hope that we can get people back inside mm -hmm. uh, so that we can interact with them. That's, That's the right. thing I miss the most is the interaction with people. And we really want to get back to that. From time to time, the food pantry has, for me anyway, been sort of our, our, our first line of defense against other other things people are experiencing, right? So we might see them for the first, or encounter them for the first time at the food pantry, but they might have other needs. And, and that for me is a good way, you know, as a clergy person, I can then report back to the clergy association and say, you know, we've got a lot of people right now who are in need of heating assistance. What programs are available? What can we offer to folks? You know, and that can help us get a better sense of what's going on in the community. That's really hard during COVID because there's a lot less of that community building. 
usually sort of right through these glass windows behind me. That's the that's the room where our clients usually come in and sit and fill out their form, their grocery list and um, and interact with our volunteers and interact with each other. And that's been a great time for us to get to know them and to do a little bit of that sort of community building. We're really missing that during COVID. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. I think that's true that hunger rarely happens in isolation. Uh, and so you guys aren't uh, necessarily all trained social workers. You don't all have the resources of professional services in the community, but it sounds like you are committed to trying to discern if there are trends or if there are needs and to try to refer people to other services that will support them through this time. Yeah, you know, so the food pantry has really grown from what Phyllis talked about as just a sort of church mission here into a vital town service. And as we've grown, and one of the things we're talking about now is what, what are the other needs in the community that aren't being met? Where are people falling through the cracks? And we, I, I think we don't, as we are right now, we don't have the capacity to provide those other services or to make those connections. But it's one of the things that we're thinking about for the future. How, how can we get folks more connected to the things that they need? For example, there is no emergency housing mm -hmm. in Reading, in Woburn, in Stoneham, in Wakefields, and any, any sort of like short-term shelter housing right now has a wait list. And so one of the things we're realizing is that when our when our clients fall into homelessness, which looks differently for a lot of people, it doesn't necessarily look like being on the street, but like couch surfing or, or not being in a safe space, right? Mm -hmm. We'd love to, we'd love to be able to refer them to services that are not in Cambridge, right? Right. right. Especially if there are children who are accessing the schools and Right, and we can't provide that right now, but it's one of the things that we're noticing. All right, All right. well, it sounds like you, uh, if I'm reading between the lines correctly, uh, one thing I heard was deep gratitude to the Reading community for recognizing the needs that are always there, but that grew particularly pronounced, especially at the beginning of the pandemic and for responding it's been appreciated, it's been noticed, and we hope that the community will continue to stay involved. I remember when I was doing some anti-poverty work, we get so many donations and volunteers around the holidays, and that was marvelous. And it is a time that it's important to connect with people, but the needs continue all year long. So um, I hope our community will continue to do the great job it's already doing of responding 365 days a year. That's right. That's right. And thank, thank you, so thank you to, not to, not only to everybody who has donated this year or who has, lots of you have, um, have done a drive or who've done a fundraiser through your work or have sought matching funds through your, through your work. I mean, thank you to all of you who have done that. Also, thank you who, to those of you who have donated your time in a new way, who have said yes to coming on and serving in one of these new roles. And to those of you who have reached out asking for a volunteer spot that we don't have right now, thank you for your patience <laughs> um, and having us accommodate you. And thanks right. especially to Phyllis, her husband, Bruce, Charlotte, Anna, Simone, all of the folks who have sort of um, held together all these changes at the food pantry. Thank you. Thank you. It's just been such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.